You are strong. You are brave. You are capable. You are part of the Lord's most valuable creation. You have ability. You have potential. You have gifts given to you by the Lord. You have talents to share with the world. You are a writer, an athlete, an inventor, an artist, a musician, a technician, and these talents will change people. You have joy to spread. You have jokes to tell, kind words to give, and wisdom to bestow. And that joy will change people. You are full of more amazing qualities, traits, and virtues than you could ever imagine, given to you by the Lord who loves you, who loves you, who loves you no matter who you are, whether you're the big man on campus or the small guy in the back of the library, whether you like swinging baseball bats or you like swing dancing, whether you're the fastest or the slowest, the tallest or the shortest, the skinniest or you could lose a few pounds, whether you're captain of the team or last one picked, whether your dad could beat up his dad or you never had anyone in your life who could fill that role, whether you're the champion of champions or you feel like the loser of losers, regardless of who you may think you are, the reality is, is that you have a responsibility because you have a power inside of you. A power that was formed before the beginning of time in a secret place by the God of the universe. There is a man inside of you, inside of each and every one of you that is waiting to burst forth and change the world. A man that loves, encourages, comforts, shares, teaches, laughs, cries, and who builds up those around him. That man is where your strength lies. That man is where your potential lies. And that man is where your gifts, talent, courage, ability, and joy lies. And your responsibility as a son of God is to find that man and to set that man free. And when he is set free, he will bring change to our broken world. You will bring change to our broken world. And any voices in your head that are trying to tell you differently are from the enemy. And the next time you hear them, this is what you say. You say, nah, uh not me, Satan. I am a son of the living God, treasured, entrusted, and loved above all things by the creator of all things for the glory of him who is greater than all things. I am awesome. And don't you forget it, this is who you are. Happy Father's Day. Turn to somebody and tell them you are in the right place today. Wow. Can you hear me? I think they got it too loud. Now pull it back down just a little bit. I bring you greetings from Honduras. Um, if you're new to Metro Tab or, or if this is your first Sunday, I'm Steve Ball. I'm the pastor. Or if you've been here a while, I'm still the pastor. <laughs> I've been gone longer than I've ever... The only time I've been gone this long was when I went away, for, went away to college uh, a long time ago. So, but I'm glad to be back. And we had some major accomplishments while we were there. Um, three things that had to take place. And I thought I was going to get it all done and get home with Brittany and the baby. Um, but that didn't happen. So hopefully uh, in the next few days or weeks we'll make that happen. So keep praying for us. I know they are ready to come home. And uh, I put Rita on the plane yesterday, so she's gone. But at any rate, we're here, and it's Father's Day, and it's a good day. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we're honored, we're honored to have all of you. And we're here to honor all the dads today. Would you put your hands together for all the fathers, all the dads? I know there are a lot of stories in the room about fathers and sons and daughters and uh, some of the growing up years, things that took place. I remember when I was a kid, uh, I got a chemistry set. I'd always wanted to have a chemistry set, and I got one for Christmas or birthday or some occasion. And so I did what a kid does with a chemistry set. He starts mi mixing chemicals up. And I did that, and my dad looked out the bathroom window one morning, and he saw that out there on the yard there was a lot of dead grass. And he said... I was, I was standing there behind him, and he said, 
something's wrong with our grass. It's dying out there. And I said, Dad, I did that. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, my chemistry said. He said I, I said, I told him, I said, I mixed up the chemicals and I put it on the grass and that's what it's supposed to do. And he, he was not happy about that. He said, you killed my grass? I said, yes. <laughs> I thought that's what I was supposed to do with the chemistry set, you know, make up some grass killer. Another thing I did is I made some invisible ink. And I had this little pen and when he came in from work one day at lunch on his, in, in his white shirt, he came in, I greeted him at the door, and whoosh, I squirted that black ink all over his white shirt, and he looked down. And I'll say that all the years that uh, I lived at home, my dad never abused me or beat me or anything, but that day he did swing at me. And I backed up, and he missed me, and I said, but look, it's gone, it's gone. And it did disappear. I know there have been a lot of stories like that over the years with fathers and their children. Reminds me of the little boy that didn't want to go to school one day, and he called. The principal answered the phone, and he said, Little Johnny's not going to be able to make it to school today. And the principal said, well, who is this? He said, it's my father. <laughs> you want another one? <laughs> one more? <laughs> little, little Johnny came home from school one day, and the dad said, where's your report card? It's report card day. And he said, I don't have my report card, Dad. And he said, what do you mean you don't have your report card? It's report card day. He said, I loaned it to Billy. He wanted to scare his dad. So turn to somebody and say, Happy Father's Day. We do honor all the dads today. And uh, I understand Pastor Rita did a great job the last uh, few weeks filling in for me. I'm sure she's watching by internet. Hey, baby, I love you. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> she always raises the bar when I'm gone, and it's very difficult for me to come back and try to uh, you know get to the standard that she did so today I got two guys to help me because I knew I needed all the help I could get So I want to introduce to you. Dr. Randall Paris and dr. Joseph Martin. Would you put your hands together for both of them? And we're going to talk today a few minutes about a father's journey uh, As we begin today, you've heard me say it many times and I'll say it again today because it really fits where we are today but everybody has a story everybody in this room has a story you have a story I have a story the person next to you has a story and the story needs to be told a lot of people don't tell their story for whatever reason they they hold it inside or they don't tell the story but there's something really liberating about telling your story and not only do you need to tell it there are others that need to hear your story but we as human beings we're guilty sometime of um, really judging people we tend to size people up in short we look them over we see the package on the outside and and we make a judgment call about who they are and what they are just by one little glance we have that first impression and we make a judgment call but it's dangerous to do that because when you look at somebody and you think well they've got it all together and you know they live in a nice house or drive a nice car or they're dressed just right or whatever we we use to judge them and we look at the the cover of the book we look at the person on the outside you may not know their story you don't know the price they paid to get where they are you don't know all the sum total of their life and it's dangerous just to look at somebody and try to decide who they are based on that so today um, I want you to understand that we have expectations about our own life God has expectations about us and how we should live and what we should do the Bible is a road map and it gives us direction but not only that sometimes we mess up we fail we fall we struggle and sometimes the disappointments in life cause us to want to give up anybody ever wanted to quit see how many honest folks we have here today. anybody ever wanted to quit I thought so we've all had struggles and challenges and times when we when we wanted to give up when we wanted to quit and we look at somebody and we size them up and we decide well they've got it all together they you know but you don't know what they've been through and of course the danger is that we're looking on the outside the Bible gives us a scripture in first Samuel chapter 16 verse 7 it says but the Lord said to Samuel don't judge by his appearance or height for I have rejected him the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them people judge by outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart 
Aren't you glad that God looks at the heart? You may have it together on the outside, but you may be going through a storm and a crisis on the inside. But God's got you. I want to introduce you today to Dr. Randall Paris. I want to tell you a little bit about his story. He's a successful minister, speaker, life coach, trainer, successful husband, successful father. He's got a lot of accomplishments under his belt, many awards. He's traveled around the, war, uh, around the world. He's uh, the leadership development coordinator for his denomination. He's sought after for leadership as a leadership coach and training. He teaches uh, leaders and emerging leaders. He loves to do that. He's spent a lot of time also uh, ministering to young people and young adults. He is a university professor, not only teaching uh, at Lee University, but he's also uh, ministered in Asia at a university there and goes uh, frequently to, to minister to college students there. He has uh, spent a lot of time in the mission work around the world doing various kinds of mission activities. When you look at him and you say, wow, he's got it all together. He's got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, an earned doctorate degree. We have to call him doctor. Everybody say doctor. doctor. See? He's got it together. And that is the package that we see. That's what friends see. That's what strangers see. That's what we see. That's what the world sees. But it's dangerous just to judge a book by the cover because there's more to the story. And today, I want Randy Paris, Dr. Randall Paris, to share with you some of the story that you can't see and that you don't know. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for being here on this Father's Day. Everybody has their theories of what fatherhood really is. This is just one I've come up with recently. 90% of fatherhood is yelling at your kids for leaving the door open when the air conditioning in the house is on. That's 90%. Because they were raised in a barn, Being right? a dad, exactly, exactly. And for those of you that are struggling to know what to get a husband or a dad for Father's Day, basically all we really deep down inside want is to go to sleep in the recliner with a half-eaten piece of pizza in our hand. That's pretty much, we're happy at that point. We're not that hard to please. You want to know a little of my story? My mom and dad were married very young, right out of high school in North Carolina, and moved to Michigan, where opportunity seemed to be. I think my dad went up there originally to work for General Motors, as a couple of his uncles had done, but instead he launched his own business. He bought a small gas station, did pretty well with that, and kind of upgraded and bought a newer and nicer and bigger one in a better part of town and sold that, and then he started Bruce's Collision and Paris Auto Sales and Master Radiator, and uh, a car battery store. So he had four businesses going at about age 30 on Elizabeth Lake Road in Pontiac, Michigan. He was very successful for a young man. We were a church family. My mom and dad were raised in church and were raising us well. My dad was disconnected from his faith and occasionally would go with us to church on Sunday mornings, but that was about it. But my mom was very grounded in her faith, and for that I'm thankful. But, you know, all-American family, mom, dad, two kids, and a dog, literally, lived on the lake in Michigan, had a nice little home, and probably we're going to upgrade pretty soon to something nicer. We went on family vacation and came back, and literally the day we came back, my dad said he had to go to the office. You know, after a 600-mile drive, that seemed a little awkward, but, you know, he always worked. He worked a lot, and I wasn't around him a great deal because he worked so much. And so my mom, for some reason, and I'm not sure why, decided she would go to his office that afternoon, late evening, to see if he really was there. And he was not. But she saw his car. His Cadillac was parked at the bar across the street from where his businesses were. She walked in probably for the first time in her life ever to an establishment like that. And in that dimly lit room found my dad seated next to another woman. When they came home, I was downstairs watching the baseball all-star game. I was a big baseball guy, and I heard commotion upstairs. There was a lot of carrying on, a lot of crying, it sounded like, and I, I listened from the bottom of the stairs, and when I heard all the crying and commotion, I thought, well, my, my granddad or my grandmother, one of them on either side had died. Something bad was wrong. And I came upstairs, and my dad had on sunglasses, trying to hide the fact that he was crying. And my mom very bluntly said, tell them, tell your kids, tell them what you've done. Tell Renee and Randall what you've done. 
And my dad couldn't speak. He just went to the master bedroom closet and pulled out a suitcase and started packing it. And my mom explained that he was involved and had an affair going on. And at that point, we thought it had been going on for an entire year. He packed his bags and with tears apparently behind those sunglasses, got in his car and drove out and moved in with the other woman that night. I never, ever have spent the night under the same roof with my father since that day. The woman he he was involved with was very different from the people I knew, worldly, involved in stuff that I had very little knowledge of, as probably my dad was involved in as well. The other woman would call our home at night, two in the morning, drunk, and cuss my mom out and call her names and say all the things that she wanted to do to us and how she knew where my sister and I went to school and how she was going to have somebody hurt us and our home was vandalized and our mailbox was knocked down and these were cruel and ugly, angry, sinful people that I didn't know what to do with. And at 13 years old, I kept my Crossman pellet gun in my bedroom and a baseball bat in my bedroom to protect my mother and sister from what I thought were these crazy people that were going to try to hurt them in some way. My dad and I tried to have some relationship, go out to eat sometimes, and I I worked for him some over at his business, washing cars and that kind of thing. And I guess we gave it a shot, but he more and more seemed to pull away. And when I became a senior in high school and it was graduation night, and I hoped he would come, He went to her son's graduation instead of mine. When my sister graduated from college, he didn't come. When I graduated from college, he didn't come. When my sister married Tim, he wasn't there to walk her down the aisle. He missed all of that. I've seen my dad two times in the last 28 years. One of those times was on my 50th wedding anniversary of my grandparents, his mother and dad. They'd been married 50 years, and he came to that celebration. That's the first time I'd seen him in a long, long time. It was awkward and kind of difficult to connect. About that time, I was marrying Rhonda, and I I called my dad, and I, I just tried to kind of set the record straight. And I told him I would never understand what he did, never understand why he did it, never understand why he deserted my sister and me the way he did and that I was trying my best to forgive him but it was a slow process but I was doing my best and I guess in some ways I kind of cleared the air and I'd established at that point in spite of what my dad was or wasn't it was time for me to be my own man and be the man that God had called me to be and so that's how Rhonda and I launched our marriage and our family Come to find out he hadn't been involved with that woman a year. He'd been involved with her six years. And so since I was in about first grade through about sixth grade, he had already had two lives going on. So the wounds were deep. They affected me for a long time. And I don't care who you are, and I don't care when you lose your dad, whether it's through divorce or death or some other way. If you're 3 or 13 or 33, it doesn't matter. There is a vacuum and a hole left in your heart. That's all there is to it. And that vacuum in that hole was there, and it made me struggle with relationships. Whenever I would get close to a young lady and think maybe I could love her or could be in love, you know, I would get scared and panic and back out because literally in an hour's time, my little perfect family blew up and was never the same. And so my fears ran deep. I think part of my attraction to Rhonda, besides the fact that she was smoking hot, And those of you that are wondering when you see Rhonda and me together, she was sober and in her right mind when she said yes, that she would marry me. (laughs) There's a lot of question about that, but it's true. I think part of the attraction beyond just the neat connection we had relationally and common core values and those kinds of things is I was attracted to her family. I was attracted to the stability that I saw in her mother and dad and sisters and in particular her father. And if you had the privilege of knowing Pastor Atkinson when he was serving here and ministering among some of you before he went on to be with the Lord. You see, I learned a lot. See, that's the cool thing that the Lord did for me. He put other men in my life, and I paid attention. Simple, 
honest, hardworking, down-home men in my home church who looked after me and prayed with me when I came to the altar. They let me play on the men's softball team, gave me a uniform when I was 14, probably too young to play men's softball, probably not good enough. In fact, when they put you as the catcher on the slow-pitch softball team, it says something about your level of ability. If there was ever going to be a play at the plate, I was supposed to get out of the way and let the pitcher cover home. <laughs> that was the plan. They didn't want me to get hurt. <laughs> and yet there were men in my home church that when we had like a father-son banquet, maybe on Father's Day weekend, there was a dad or two that didn't have sons. They only had daughters. So they would come to me and adopt me for the day, and they would let me go to the father-son banquet with them. And my youth pastor, Ken Shelton, let me see life up close and personal. And I watched how he and his wife managed their marriage and managed their little girls. And I learned so much about fatherhood from him and from my buddy Bill Isaacs and from Papa Adkinson and the way he treated his daughters and his grandkids. And for those examples, I'm grateful. And I would encourage you, if you don't have a dad or you're estranged from your dad or you're dad's an idiot, like so many of them seem to be, that you find other godly men and that you pay attention and you lock on and you watch what they do. And I'm still in the process because I'm still learning to be a dad. Our children are 16 and 19. We're not done yet, so I'm not going to tell you I have a clue of what it means to be a good dad. They tell me you don't know if you've been a good parent until your kids are grown and you watch them raising their own kids. And then maybe you start to know if you did. But I will tell you this much, because my dad didn't do a good job, I was determined to be different. And I made up my mind that I was gonna be a good dad. And it's the greatest job in the world. I love being a dad. It's my favorite thing to do ever. And I'm not perfect, but I tell you what, I've tried hard. And when they were born, I was engaged to the process. There's not a woman in this room that can change a diaper any better than I can. <laughs> I knew how to make bottles. I knew how to make cereal. I knew how to change diapers. I knew how to give baths. And if Rhonda went to a women's conference like Daughters of Destiny, she didn't worry because I could manage those two little ones no problem. I love doing it. It was my pleasure. And I've just made it my my goal and my point over the years to be there. There's an old Mama Childers that I know. You know the Childers family. She used to say, 80% of life is just showing up. And there's a lot of truth to that. If you want to be a good dad, I think a lot of it's just showing up. And so I would get my kid's school calendar and I would work my ministry and teaching calendar around it. And if there was a game, I was there and if there was an event, I was there. And if there was an honor society or a certificate presentation or a club something, I tried to be there. And when the youth choir sang at church, I made sure I was home that Sunday. I wanted to be there. I remember one weekend in particular, I used to do summer camps for kids. And, uh, you know, a couple weeks of that, you were so tired, you can't even think. I mean, you're just living in a fog. You're so exhausted. And it was that kind of week. We're in about week three, and it's Friday, and I told Rhonda, Clay's got a baseball game tomorrow morning and it's an hour and a half away he was on a tournament team and they traveled some and I said I just don't know if I can get up tomorrow and do that but somehow or another when I went to bed that night I thought okay I need, I'm gonna go and I set my clock and I got up and got ready and took clay and we drove and got there early and did the deal and it was his baseball game and I'm watching and wouldn't you know that baseball game at about 12 years old, he popped one over the 270 fence and trotted around those bases on that solo home run. And his whole team went out to meet him at home plate. I promise you, it was an amazing moment for me as a dad. It was like a religious experience. <laughs> I think I cried. I think I hugged dads on the opposing team side. I'm not sure. I kind of lost control there for a few minutes because I was so proud of him. And more than that, I was proud that I didn't miss that moment. So I try hard to be there and be involved with my kids and, and do the daily life. And when I have to travel and I do a fair amount, I take flights that leave at 5.30 from Chattanooga, which means getting up about three. You know why? It means I stayed home that night. And when I get back, it doesn't matter what time it's gonna be or how far I have to drive, I get back as soon as I can so I can be under our roof and so the kids will know that I'm home. 
I don't know exactly what it means to be a good dad, but I know what the Heavenly Father does. He's very patient. He's very loving. He's very protective. And he loves giving good gifts to his children. And so I've embraced some of those principles. And that's the kind of dad that I'm trying to be. That's part of my story. And I know Randall Paris, and he is a good dad, a good father, a good husband. He's got two beautiful kids. And Randall, you've done a good job. God bless you. He's done a good job. So it's important to find out the rest of the story. On the other side of me is Dr. Joseph Martin. In a lot of ways, they have parallel stories. Both of them are achievers. Both of them have worked diligently to overcome and to compensate for some of the struggles they had in their childhood. Dr. Joseph Martin is a successful educator also. He's a speaker, a motivator. Rita calls him an irritational speaker. Actually, he and Rita call each other irritational speakers. Some of us try to motivate. They irritate so you can change. But he's a business owner, successful business owner. Both of them are authors. Dr. Joseph has spoken on more than 500 college campuses and universities. He has been awarded uh, as a speaker, motivator, and conference speaker, he has numerous awards. He was the youngest professor ever hired in the state of Florida at the age of 24. He was communications director for the governor of Florida, Governor Lawton Childs. He was a successful TV show host as well as radio and TV guest. Would you welcome Dr. Joseph Martin? And that's the package that you see. But like Dr. Paris, there's a story that you don't see. Dr. Martin, share some of your story. Thank you, Pastor Ball. Um, this is my second opportunity to hear Randy share his story. And the more I hear Randy's story, um, I find out that our stories do parallel. Um, I was his father. Let me say that again. I was his dad. When I say that, I grew up in one of the toughest projects in Miami in a place called Liberty City. And most of you have heard of Liberty City either because of rap music or Grand Theft Auto. Um, but very tough neighborhood where I grew up. My mom was 16 years old when she had me. And she had my sister at 17. So by the time she was in high school as a junior, she had two kids and she proceeded to drop out of high school to raise us. My dad decided um, he couldn't handle the responsibility of being a father, so he decided to um, just leave when I was two years old. My mom obviously had a lot of issues with that. Um, she had her own demons that she was battling, but my father was never there, um, was never a presence in my life. He wasn't around for games. He didn't see me uh, any of my games, never um, called, never checked in on me, never sent a birthday card, never sent a, a, a Christmas wish or gift or anything, never checked on to see how even we were doing. Um, matter of fact, when I grew up in my neighborhood, I never saw any young person with a father. Now, I saw men in my neighborhood. Well, let me take that back. I saw males in my neighborhood. There's a difference between being a male and being a man. You don't choose your gender, but you have to choose to be a man. And the, uh, quote, men that I did see in my neighborhood were either drug dealers, game bangers, pimps, hustlers. They were irresponsible. They were reckless. Um, they were disrespectful. And they were very abrasive. And this is what... I was exposed to and all I knew is that I didn't want to be that my dad was not present so we were very very poor and we struggled very very mightily uh, as a child when I was a child um, I, I mentioned early in the earlier service that um, we were so poor that my younger sister used to steal food from her fast food job just so we could eat um, some of the refreshments you enjoyed out there today that was more food than I probably saw in a year um, growing up as a kid I used to go to a school just for the free food and so I had a very dis, uh, distaste for men, and I, I want men to hear this. Um, I hear women all the time complain about men. You couldn't have hated men more than I did because I couldn't trust them because the only man that ever meant anything in my life, my dad wasn't there, but I did have a man who stepped in for me, who decided to take me under his wing and, and, and tutor me and mentor me. He was the first man to tell me that he ever loved me before. 
That same, same man betrayed my trust and sexually abused me for a as a child for three years of my life. And I never told a soul about it. And so here my dad walks out. He's not available. He's not around. He came back in my life briefly when I was 12 years old. Just enough time to cause some more damage, then walk out again. Uh, I remember one damaging thing he said to me as a child that I never forgot when I was 12 when I went to visit him. And I, he asked me to leave. He said that I'd rather have my dog live with me than you. Now, I say that to you now because I have a relationship with my father right now. I just called him this morning and wished him a happy Father's Day. And I, I tell you that because as I was growing up with this distrust and this distaste in my mouth for men, um, by the time I reached the age of 16, I had been physically abused, sexually abused, emotionally abused. Um, I've witnessed six of my friends die before I was 16 years old. I had seen a, at least a dozen of my friends get incarcerated before I reached the age of 16. And even though I had suffered so much abuse by the time I reached the age of 17, I proceeded to abuse myself for the next 16. And I have to explain what I'm talking about, how I became Randy's father. Um, a lot of people ask me, Joe, you accomplished so much at such a young age, because by the time I was, by the time I was the first person in my family ever to graduate from high school, let alone go to college. I barely graduated from high school, but I overcompensated for the lack of a father being in my life. Because I, I said that vowed that a lot of young men who've been hurt and abandoned by their, their parents or their, their father in particular, said, I won't ever be that kind of man. I'm going to show him. And for those of you who on this Father's Day who you can't look up to your father, you have to hear me on this. There is nothing strong or brave or courageous or righteous about anyone who suffers in silence. Listen to what I say. See, we like to think we're men and we're strong because that no good man walked out on us. I'm going to show him. Oh, I did. I overcompensated. I went off to college, graduated early at the age of 20 at the top of my university class. Out of 10,000 students on my campus, I was voted student of the year. I was the only student of color in all of my classes. Not only that, I started my first business at the age of 22. Bought my mom a house at the age of 21. Bought my first house before I graduated from college. Owned three homes by the time I was 27. Worked for the governor's office as a communications director. Was making a six digit income before I even reached the age of 30. Had three homes. And yet I was overcompensating, trying to fill that void that you mentioned that was never filled. Listen to me, men. I abused myself over the next 70 years with success. And when I met the woman of my dreams in college when I was a freshman, I loved this woman dearly, but I did not share my pain and my struggle with her. And you know how they say hurting people hurt other people? I was married to this woman for 16 years. I was with her for 20 years, and I became your father. I abused her and I committed adultery, not just once, several times and lost count because I felt I was entitled, and she had no idea. This is not the man I married. Who is this guy? You know who this guy was? This was a boy still hadn't chosen to be a man, who was still suffering in silence, who still did not reach out to get support from other men. I didn't meet a real man until I was 33 years old. And when I told my mom I met this man, I said, Mom, I met this man. He's a Christian. She said, baby, you've seen Christians before? I said, no, he's a real one, a real man who had eight children, who loved his wife. And I asked this man, I know you have eight. Could you adopt just one more? I'm his only black child. He became my spiritual father. But I had to go through this journey. And I learned some things about that painful childhood that I, I had to endure. One, I learned that I was a mistake to my parents. I understand that, but not to my purpose. See, my parents did not plan me, but God did. And so I realized that that, that that was just one aspect of my life. I also learned that how you're treated is not your value. That doesn't determine your worth. Because I was uh, abused and mistreated, and I thought that's who I was. I had a tough time even believing in a God. Because my question is, how could God be so good if my life was so bad? How could I be in so much pain and he just watch it and not do anything about it? So I know some of you are spiritual and you're Christian. You've been Christian your whole life. I struggled with Christianity. I struggled with God because I'd pray he'd never answer. But I didn't realize that those unanswered prayers was preparing me to one day be a father. So I blew up my family and I destroyed and broke my ex-wife's heart. 
and I destroyed my son's heart and broke his family. And when my son was only 10 years old, he asked me, when we got a divorce, he was nine, he asked me at 10, he says, Dad, can't God fix this? Can't God fix this? And I told him, I said, yes, he can, but we're too selfish to let him do it. And a lot of times we as fathers, we make the selfish choice instead of the right choice. Not realize that our children are watching us. So I learned that, that my value is not determined by how I'm treated. Because if you want to know the value of something, one, you have to look at who owns it. And you have to look at the price they paid for it. And last time I checked, God owns me. He owns me. And the price that he paid for me was his son dying on a cross for me. So that means I'm worth it. So I'm worth it. And also what I learned from enduring that childhood was the fact that during that first 17 years of my life, that was my worst time. And even the devil on his best day couldn't ruin me on his worst day. So I say, I'm going to de dedicate my life to ruining his life for the rest of my life. And so, just like Randy said, um, I don't know what advice I can give you as fathers, but what I can tell you is what has worked for me because now I, God has shown me so much grace and mercy. Not only after I've destroyed my life and my family by overcompensating and betraying the trust of the person who meant so much to me at that time, God restored everything for me. Not only did he give me another wife, because I didn't think I deserved to be married again. He gave me a wonderful wife, a woman who loves the Lord. He blessed me with a daughter, me with a daughter, and says, I'm going to make you responsible for what this child. And anyone who should not be responsible for a woman should be me. God brought me to this church. And this pastor, I don't know if he was just crazy, lost his mind, decided to put me in charge of the men's ministry at this church. And I said, God is so good. And so what advice would I give you in my humble opinion as fathers? Listen to me and listen to me carefully. Men, men, men who've chosen to be men. One, you don't have to be the perfect father. Listen to me. You do not have to be the perfect father. I'm living proof of that. Randy's living proof of that. The men in this church are living proof of that. But God, you're the perfect father that God chose for that child. See, if there was a better father, God would have chose him for my son and my daughter. But he chose me. He chose me to step into that role. So with all my faults and my flaws, my, 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 my scars, he says, Joe, I trust you enough to raise these children. So you don't have to be perfect. Nothing I learned. And I think this is vitally important. It's not just enough to be a parent. Hear me, parents. This is for moms as well as dads. You have to be transparent. A lot of you, as I'm sharing my story and Randy's sharing his story, you're sitting there and saying, I cannot believe they're sharing that. Are you a real parent? See, when you're a real parent, you become transparent. See, I want my son and my daughter to know that when I take off this suit, there's not an S on my chest. I'm sorry if I've disappointed you. I'm sorry I'm not working the, I'm walking the perfect walk that you would like to see me walk. But the last time I checked, only one person has ever walked this planet who is perfect. And so I want my, my son and my daughter to know that I'm not perfect by a long shot. I told, they would tell you the first thing, my dad is jacked up. But guess what? He's our jacked up father. And we love him. And last but certainly not least, and dads, I'm challenging you as men. We can't just be, we got to be examples to our children, not excuses. Let me say that again. We must be examples to our children, not excuses. One of the toughest things I ever had to do in my life was to go to my son and tell him that something that God had put on my heart. And I've challenged my son and my daughter for this. And guys, you may think I'm crazy, but I'm challenging each of you. If you want to be men, step up. And I had to step up, and I was scared to death. And I went to my son. My lips are quivering, and my, my eyes are watering. And he says, Dad, what's wrong? I said, Kendall, I have to tell you something. And when I say it, I can't take it back. But God told me to share this with you. He said, well, Dad, just tell me. I said, but Kendall, I'm scared. He said, Dad, you can tell me. What is it? And my son was probably 12 years old at the time. And I told him, I said, Kendall, look at me. You act the way you see me act. You think the way you see me think. You speak the way you hear me speak. You treat people the way you see me treat people. You love women the way you see me love women. You love your wife the way I love my wife. You raise your children the way you see me raise my children. You fall the way I fall and you get up the way I get up. You respond the way I respond. You react the way I react. You forgive the way I forgive. You humble yourself the way I humble myself. 
Kendall, what I'm telling you, son, is you be you and what God has called you to be, but you do me. You do me. If you call yourself a real man, look your children in the eye and say, do me. Run after him the way I run after him. Pray the way you see me pray. Worship the way you see me worship. Respond the way you see me respond. I'm sorry I am irritational, Pastor, because here's my belief. If you can't look at your children and say, if you can't say, be me, you have no right to be there. Thank you. How many know there are no perfect fathers, no perfect moms, no perfect kids, but we can learn and we can grow. We look at these gentlemen today and they've achieved a lot of great success. The most important thing is that they are good fathers. They both have two beautiful kids, both their sons going to college, got scholarships. They poured into them to make a difference. And some of you are thinking today, some of the dads here are thinking, well, yeah, but, well, I want to say to you, what is the takeaway? What can we learn from this? What can we do to make a difference? Because everybody has a story. And anyone can be successful if they will do several things. Number one, get on the right track. Maybe you've made a lot of mistakes. Maybe you've been on the wrong track. You've done the wrong things. We've made mistakes. We all have. But we can make a conscious decision to get on the right track and then go in the right direction. Go forward in the right direction. Don't just get on the right track, but make up your mind to go forward because everything about you was built to go forward. When you look at your body, God created us to go forward, even though we can back up or go sideways. You hurt yourself that way. He created us to go forward. And then number three, don't quit. No matter what, no matter how many times you mess up, no matter how many times you wish you could do something over, don't quit. All of us in this room have probably had times when we wanted to quit, when we wanted to give up, when we had a good reason. Randy had a good reason to give up. Joe had a good reason to give up, but they didn't give up. And even though today you may be facing chaotic circumstances, crisis in your life, your marriage, Whatever it is, don't give up. There's some scriptures, I think, that would encourage us. In Proverbs 23, verse 24, it says, The father of a righteous man has great joy. He who has a wise son delights in him. Another verse in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. There's a responsibility on us not to stress the kids out. Certainly we have to discipline them. Certainly there are things that we need to do in our training, but don't push them to the max that they're exasperated. Bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And then in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26, those who fear the Lord are secure. He will be a refuge for their children. Those who fear the Lord are secure. You can be secure in the Lord. You can be secure in your relationship with Him. And if you'll do that, you will be a refuge for your kids. I thought about how to end this service today. And I got a letter a few days ago. Tammy sent to Rita, Tammy Kibble. And I've asked her to come and, and read this letter that she wrote about her dad and her husband and dancing with the Lord. Tammy, if you would just come and take a moment and share this story. Back in February, on the way to work one morning just prior to Valentine's Day, um, I saw a church sign and it was announcing Dancing with Dads. At first I thought, how sweet. Then I thought, I would really have liked to have had that opportunity. Then I began to think back over my life and wondered how much of it would have been different had my father been around to dance with. Now, my dad didn't leave me voluntarily. He died very unexpectedly at 36 years of age. I was 11 at the time, and I have little to no memory of him, but there's something deep down inside of me that's always longed for that relationship. 
something in my knower just knows that if that relationship had been there or available, I would have not have gone down the paths that I went down for so long. I bounced from boyfriend to boyfriend and later marriage to marriage, all in search of that one relationship. How sad it is that while I was bouncing around, I couldn't find anything to fill that void. I don't even think I, I had a clue I had a void, much less that I was trying to fill it. Don and I had not been seeing one another for any length of time at all when one day he looked at me and out of nowhere he announced he loved me. I actually laughed in his face. I told him there was no way he could love me. I told him he didn't even know me. We had no history. I told him there was no way he could just decide he loved me. Don very quietly and sweetly informed me that yes, he could decide to love me and that he had and that I'd see for myself soon enough. I remember actually patting him on the head and thinking, you idiot, you ain't got a clue. As Don and I continued seeing one another, he begins to talk about getting married. I remember thinking to myself, why not? I can always get another divorce. I knew that Don loved me more than I loved him. To tell the truth, I think for me it was more along the lines of I needed a man in my life, a daddy, someone or something to fill the void. Don was probably the nicest man I had ever known. I figured our life would be a little boring, but so long as we had no major problems, I could handle that, at least for a while. So with those thoughts, I married him. I bought a 1920 farmhouse just shortly before Don and I did marry. I bought this house on my own because I was determined that married again or not, I was never going to rely on another man to meet my needs. In other words, if my soon-to-be new husband didn't like it, there was the door, my way or the highway. Not too long after we had married and Don had moved in, Don steps through the back door and made some sort of announcement that he was going to Ace Hardware to get parts for something. The old farmhouse we were in was an old row house. In other words, it was a long rectangle with a center support wall running down the entire length of the house. And with its current configuration, you had to walk all the way down one side to, get, to go through a door to get to the other side. So there we were. Don was on one side of the wall and I was on the other. I remember not liking the fact that he had made a decision without me or my permission concerning whatever it was, so I smarted off at him and told him he wasn't going to go do that. He very sweetly but, fir but firmly informed me once again that yeah, he was going to go do it and that he'd be back in a minute. Needless to say, that flew all over this redneck. Every demon I possessed manifested, and I began to stomp down through the old house and around the wall and head straight at him. I was saying all kinds of choice stuff. As I approached Don, I could see he wasn't being swayed one bit by my fit. So I took it to another level. I was prepared to do war. At this point, Don had raised his arms and out stretched his hands as if to prepare to grab me when I got close enough. I remember having a sane moment and thinking, now that's a pretty big boy, sister. You might want to back off. But no, Every, I allowed all those demons to take control. They said to me, go for it. Don't let this man tell you what is and what ain't. I was expecting to be grabbed and put into the wall at the least and had determined probably get hit too, but I didn't care. No way was I back and down from this argument, which to this point had all been one-sided and I hadn't even realized it. Right as I got to within arm's reach of him, he very carefully, on purpose, intently, but very gently took me in his, in his hands, pulled me into his chest, wrapped his big old arms around me, all the way around me, into one of the most wonderful, gentle, touching embraces I have ever felt. He very calmly kissed me on top of my head, told me he loved me, and then very sweetly said to me, baby, don't do me that way. Then he turned and went out the door to do just exactly what he told me he was going to go do. He left me standing there, stunned. He hadn't argued with me, hadn't called me names. He never even made a face at me. As far as I could tell, I hadn't even managed to make him mad. And I had tried hard, and as hard as I had tried, I had failed to engage him in war. And you need to understand where I come from, I can do war, I'm good at it. But there I stood, me and all those little demons running around in my head trying to figure out what had just happened and how it had happened. 
we, my little demon friends and myself, had no idea what to do or even think. I was just standing there in total amazement. I was in awe. I remember the thoughts going through my head. How did he just do that? And what did he just do? I was trying to figure out how to be madder at him or find a way to turn what he had just done into something bad, but I couldn't. That's when it hit me. For the first time in my life, I wanted something somebody else had. I was fully capable of getting the material things I wanted or needed, but he had something I didn't, and I couldn't put my finger on it. But whatever it was, I decided right then and there I wanted it, and I was going to get it. It wasn't his money, and it wasn't his material possessions. It wasn't his looks, although I didn't do find you very attractive, sweetie. I really struggled at the beginning with trying to pinpoint this something. I was just dumbstruck. I had always known Don was different on the inside than any other man I'd ever known. He was quiet, gentle, strong, confident, humble, sweet, firm, fair, honest. I ain't never going to get him home in the car, am I? He even said he loved God. The list just went on and on. But I had never really given much thought to that until now. I figured most of this would go away with time, that his true personality would come out just like all the other husbands had. But Don was different. When he came home, I went into fine mode. I just ignored him. You know, I was put punishing him for doing whatever it was he had just done, even though I didn't know what that was. But that didn't work either. He just continued to adore me and love me as if the way I had acted never happened. But if he thought I was going to apologize, he had another thought coming. We were both Christian. Okay, so he was a little more Christian than I was. So when we married, we began to attend church. Don began to bring home worship music and teachings for me to listen to. Not that he was pushing anything. He would say things like, have you heard of so-and-so? Have you ever listened to this song? I watched Don because I'm a show me kind of girl. As he prayed and believed for God for things over our lives, I began to put two and two together. This thing Don had that I didn't. Was it love? Real love? Could it be God's love that the Bible talks about? I began to realize Don knew his daddy. He had a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. He wept when he praised God and worshiped God. He really felt God's love and presence in his life. God was real to Don, not some foreign being that may or may not exist. Okay, so now I had it figured out. But how was I going to get it? One day I took my Bible and walked out onto my front porch. I raised it and shook it at God, and I told God, okay, if you exist, I need to be able to sit down, read this book, and understand it, and for it to be the living word that you say it is in my life. I told him it was full of all of these these and thous and very difficult to read. I remember shouting, Dustest thou understandeth me? Right before that, Don had bought me a new Bible, and it was not the King James Version. I took a chance, and I decided I might as well read this other version because the King James Version wasn't doing anything for me. Proverbs is where it fell open. Go figure that. It bubbled up in me like a well. It began to make perfect sense. Since then, I've been on a one-on-one -on -one journey with God. I found love, true love, love for my family, for my husband, and for my God. I also accepted that I'm worth loving, that God really does love me. I've learned that loving is a decision, just like Don had told me in the beginning of our relationship. I can assure you there were times over the years he could have pinched my head off, but instead he chose to walk in love towards me, godly, biblically-based love. Don made a decision to love God and be the best godly man he could be. That evening came and went, but that one moment of Don's interaction with me changed my life forever. I mean for an eternal ever. The decision God made to love me changed my life, but before he could decide to love me, he had to decide to love God. He had to decide to be the man God called him to be. He had to determine no matter what he was going to be a godly man. Because of those decisions, my life has forever changed. Back to the sign on the church about dancing with dads. Dancing with dads is not just for little girls. We all need to dance with dads. Boys and grown men need to dance with their dad. God had to hold Don in his arms and teach Don how to lead so that 
Don could take me in his arms and lead me in the dance of life here on earth. Because Don learned how to lead the dance from his daddy, my life has been forever changed. And I hope that the lives around me are also forever changed because I chose to dance with my daddy. Don taught me no matter what, he is there for me. But more importantly, he showed me that God is there for me. That God holds me when I cry. God cheers me on down the path of life and protects me. Shelters me from storms, carries me when I can no longer go on my own. Don, because of his love for God, has become so precious to me. I guess the point of this is twofold. Don decided to dance with his dad years ago, and because of that decision, I learned how to dance with Daddy too. All churches should have Dances with Daddy Day, but they should make more of it and include the boys. Dads need to teach their boys how to lead the dance of life and how to dance with their Heavenly Father. If they did, the girls would follow. I did, if, if they did, all the girls would follow. And can you imagine how all of the lives in this world will be changed forever? In 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 8, it says, Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I'm also known. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Love makes all the difference. God sent his only one son, and the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Most of us have messed up more than once, but God's love is great. And I believe that the love of God that is shed abroad to us can also be given to our sons, our daughters, our families. I want to take a moment right now and just pray for everybody, but especially for the dads. Would you just put your hand on your heart right now and just ask God to minister to you as I pray. Father, I thank you today for every person in this room and those under the sound of my voice watching by internet or those that will watch by television later. I pray right now that you would minister by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we've messed up more than once. We're not perfect. There's no perfect church or perfect people. But Lord, your love is so great and it covers the multitude of sin. And I ask that you would just touch us today and especially the dads as we honor fathers today. I pray that you would touch every father and every one that's going to be a father, I pray that you would touch us, that we would be the kinds of fathers that we should be. I pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and insight to love our kids, to love our spouse. Help us, Lord, to make a difference in their world by spending time with them and caring like you care for us. I thank you now, Lord, for bringing the power of your spirit to heal, to forgive, and to restore the broken relationships. I know that, Lord, in this life there's so much pain, but your peace, your strength heals and helps us to overcome and to conquer. We thank you now, Lord, for this day. And I pray especially that you would minister to every dad, meet every need, and help us to be the men of God that you've intended for us to be. Thank you for Dr. Paris and for Dr. Martin. I pray your blessings on them, their families, and all they set their hand to do. And we give you thanks and praise in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. Would you give these guys a great hand and Tammy for sharing?
As we close today, I want to give you an opportunity to worship God with your offerings and your gifts. We know that uh, we are living the blessed life. So I want to encourage you to tithe. If you've not done that, remind you. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are living the blessed life, and we're blessed to be a blessing. So the ushers are going to come and get in place, and they're going to sing and minister while we get ready, and then I'll let you come. So get, get your checks ready, your offerings ready. And then would you stand? And would you come and bring your offerings and your gifts? And let's worship the Lord. Then we'll all be dismissed together in just a moment. He's jealous for me.